Exodus chapter 26, and verse number 15. Again, last week we covered the outer wall. white linen wall that uh, divided the black tent from the presence of God and how that uh, there's only one way to look over the wall or to get beyond the wall and that is to go through the door. Amen. And uh, I think I'd just like to point this out again tonight that the door is the farthest point from the mercy seat. The door is at the farthest point from the very presence of God. And uh, we've got to learn. We've got to learn that there are no shortcuts to God's anointing, God's touch, God's presence in our lives. Amen. And uh, a lot of folks think that they can work it up on their own. They think they can uh, do it with a program. They think that they can do it with a, a seminar I like, I like to be challenged. And the Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to go uh, to another camp meeting atmosphere. And, and I hope to be challenged and, and encouraged in my relationship with the Lord and uh, have a greater fire when I come back. But you know what? We can't, it's not going to be done through any shortcuts. You've got to go the way that God has prescribed. And so thank God for the door. Amen. And uh, boy, I tell you, I could preach that. I think I could preach that every week. Jesus is the door. Amen. There's no other way to get to God. But tonight we're going to move on uh, and continue to talk about the wall. This will be the last night we'll uh, deal with the wall. Uh, but you see, there is more to the wall than just the door and the, uh, the linen, isn't there? There are boards sockets and bars that are a part of this now you might think now where in the world are you going to find anything where do you find Jesus Christ in boards sockets and bars but uh, uh, you'll find out you'll see tonight the pictures that are there are beautiful pictures of the ministry of Christ and um, uh, I think we'll probably be able to even see the church and what we talk about tonight. Amen. And um, I was talking to, of course, I don't know if you knew that yesterday was, and I, I can't pronounce the word right, Rosh Hashanah, or something like that. Anyway, it's the Jewish New Year. And uh, uh, I've, I've got some friends at work that are, uh, they feel like that they're the lost tribes and all that kind of stuff stuff, for lack of a better term. Uh, I was going to call it malarkey, but I'll call it stuff. But uh, um, I was talking to, to one of them today, and I, I said, I just can't understand how you can, how you can celebrate a shadow when we can enjoy the substance. Amen. How can you celebrate a shadow when we can enjoy the substance? We don't have to. And, I, and this, again, let's remember that all of this was a shadow. It was pointing to other things. It was pointing to greater things. It was pointing to Jesus Christ who is coming uh, to pave the way for us to have a way to God and His presence. And so tonight we're going to look again in the tabernacle here, namely uh, in the wall uh, that surrounds this court and see what uh, takes place here. But let's start by looking at Exodus chapter 26, starting at verse number 15. And... Um, um, 
Let's read it this way tonight. <clears throat> I'll read a verse, you read a verse in response in unison, okay? So I'll kick it off here in Exodus chapter 26 and verse number 15. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of Shittim wood standing up. Two tenons shall there be in one board, set in order one against another. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And from the side of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. And two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards on the one side of the tabernacle. And five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold for places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. All right. Boards, sockets, and bars. Let me give you another. Uh, we're going to kind of bounce Part of it isn't, but you you can see what it is. I don't think it'll make that much difference. It'll be all right. The boards. What we're looking at first of all here tonight is right here. The boards. Amen. Look at verse number fifteen, where we started off, and then we're going to go down to verse number twenty-nine. Verse number fifteen. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shittim wood standing up. And then in verse number tw 29, And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold for places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. Here is another picture of Jesus Christ that we find in the boards. And you say, now, uh, where do you see this at? In verse number 15, we are told that these uh, boards were taken. The wood of these boards was made from shittim wood, which is uh, an acacia tree. It's an acacia tree which uh, grew in the wilderness. Now you have to remember, everything that they got had to be taken from the wilderness because that's where they were. They were in the wilderness. And so uh, where do you find wood in the wilderness? You find it in an acacia tree. And uh, uh, one of the things as I was studying this and, and you, uh, as you read about the acacia tree is that it was a short, twisted, gnarly type of tree. And uh, uh, what, we can, what we look at when we look at these boards that are, are made of the wood of the acacia tree and they're overlaid with gold, as you see, 
the hu humanity of Christ in the acacia wood. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse number 2, if I could turn there real quick like, Isaiah 53, verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah writes, as a root out of dry ground. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about the branch. Amen? And I'm not talking about the branch Davidians. I'm talking about the branch. Amen? That is Jesus Christ. He shall grow up. As before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he came in the flesh. He came as in humanity. He put upon himself, he clothed himself with the flesh. He clothed himself with humanity. Somebody look up Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 17. Read that passage of scripture for me real quick. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse number 17. <clears throat> it behooved him. Now there's a word there uh, that you don't hear a whole lot anymore. Behoove. What would behoove mean? No. Yeah. There's the word that came to my mind. Advantageous. It was advent. It was to his advantage for him to be made like unto his brethren. Why is that? The scripture goes on and says so that he could be a merciful high priest. And we talked about the mercy of God. And the thing is, here is, here is God, the Father, sitting upon his throne. Here is the Son that has come and has lived the life in the flesh. And the Father looks at the Son and said, Son, how does that feel? I see what they're going through. How does that feel? Now, I know that God knows how it feels but uh, because God knows all, doesn't he? But, but he could look to his son and say, now, now, son, how does that feel? And Jesus could say, Father, I felt that same thing. And it hurts. Because he came and he lived, he walked, he dwelt among us. John wrote about him and he said, he tabernacled. Among us. He dwelt. The word dwell. I just thought of that. Look at that. John chapter 1. we got to go there. We have no choice but to go to John chapter 1. In verse number 14, and the word was made flesh. That's what we're talking about. The word was made flesh. And look at the word dwelt. And dwelt among us. You know what the word dwelt means? It means tabernacle. The word dwell means tabernacle. Jesus came and he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. He pitched his tent. It's just like the Shekinah glory of God that came down in, in the, and, and rested upon that mercy seat. Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he dwelt, he tabernacled, he lived among us. John, he wrote again. I believe it's in 1 John. I got to turn there. I'm on a rabbit trail. Don't stop me now. Amen. 1 John. Chapter 1, verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which, now listen to this, which we have seen with our eyes. It gets better. Which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. When he says the word of life, he's not talking about a Bible. He's talking about the word. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He said, we have handled him. 
We, we, we hugged his neck. We, we, we shook his hand. We embraced him. We walked with him. We looked upon him. He is the Son of God. And he came in the flesh. We in our, in, our, in our fleshly eyes, they beheld Him. These hands of flesh, they touched Him. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Thank God. Thank God that Jesus Christ came and He dwelt among us. Amen. In verse 14 of John 1, He dwelt among us. And look what John wrote again. He said, And we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. What an advantage. How many, how many times a year could anybody look at the glory of God in the tabernacle? There was one man, one time a year, that he could go into that room and he could behold the glorious presence of God. And John said, we lived with Him. We walked with Him. We ate at his table. We rode in a boat with him. He, we dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Full, full, full of grace and truth. Amen. Jesus Christ was more than just a prophet. Jesus Christ was more than just a rabbi. Je Jesus Christ was more than just a great teacher. Jesus Christ came and lived in the flesh, but He is the Son of the living God. Amen. He came and He dwelt among us. Amen. Well, <clears throat> the Scripture says in Exodus... In verse number 15, you take these boards of this acacia wood that represents the flesh. It's, it's like a root out of the dry ground. It's, it's, it's gnarly. It's knotty. It's, it's, it's a, a stubby. It, it doesn't seem to have real value. That's the flesh, isn't it? The scripture says that in the flesh there dwells how many good things? No good thing dwells in the flesh. Amen. And so you take the flesh, and what do you do? Look at verse number 29. What does verse number 29 say you do with the flesh? You wrap it in... gold. You wrap the flesh in gold. And what do you have? You have God the Son revealed in the flesh. What do you have when you wrap the flesh? Isn't it amazing? Why wouldn't you just make it out of solid gold? If you're going to put gold on it, make it of gold. But God says, no. I'm going to send my Son. He's going to live. He's going to walk. He's going to dwell in the flesh. He's going to know what it is to dwell among those that are of the flesh. He's going to experience all of the things that they will experience in their lives. He's going to know how they feel. He's going to dwell among them. They're going to handle Him. They're going to talk to Him. They're going to, they're, they will even crucify Him. But they will know that He has been in their midst. That He is the Son of God. Amen. Jesus Christ came. He was... He was 100, he was, get this, he was 100% man. Okay. Jesus Christ came. He was 100% man. You are 100% humanity. Did you know that? I, I figured you probably figured that one out. You are 100% humanity, and Jesus Christ was too, but he was also 100% God. Amen. He was the God-man. He was the God-man that came and dwelt among us. The scripture tells us that he, he took upon himself the form of flesh, and yet the scripture also says that there was no sin. He knew no sin. 
In him was no sin. Those are things that are taken right out of the pages of the Word of God. He knew no sin. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. It talks to us about the divinity, the purity, the holiness of Jesus Christ. He was more than just a mortal man. He was more than just one of us. But he came and lived and dwelt among us. And he is the Son of God. Amen. You cannot separate the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ. He is one man, but he is the God-man. Thank God. Thank God. And so what we see here in these boards on this acacia, in the acacia wood that is covered with gold, you see what the scripture that we looked at earlier and let me read it again just to reemphasize the right words here. <clears throat> but in John chapter 1, verse number 14, look, verse, look at verse number 1 first. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right? So that settles the score about who the Word is. It's God. It's Jesus Christ. He is the Word. He was with God. So it had to be someone separate from God, didn't it? He was with God. And yet the Scripture says that He was God. And the Scripture also says that He was e as eternal as God is. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And now in verse number 14 he says, And the Word was made flesh. And so what you have is you have the acacia wood, the flesh that is covered with divinity or with the gold. The God-man. Found in the boards of the tabernacle. Is it an accident? No. I think God was showing us that His Son was going to come right out from the midst of us. His Son was going to be born right in the midst. He was born among the, the, the lowest class of people, the poorest of people. He was born there. He was raised there. He ran the streets uh, playing with the children of that community. He grew up in those days right there among those. He, can, can you imagine the, 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 the splendor and the glory that Jesus Christ knew in the courts of heaven and all of the beauty and the gold and the, the gems and the jewels and, and all of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, perfection and the unity of, of, the, of the courts of heaven. And yet He comes here and He lives in poverty. He comes here and lives with men that are sinful, men that are grimy, men that are covered with the filth and the corruption of sin. The Son of God came and dwelt among us. Amen. That's the grace of God. Full of grace. Full of truth. Amen. The Son of God came and He dwelt right here among us. The boards, the acacia wood that was overlaid with gold. Jesus Christ come in the flesh. There's a lot of folks that would like to deny that fact. But it is a fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And he didn't do it to build some physical kingdom, but he came, as the scripture says, so that he might be a merciful high priest. That he could really know from experience, not just knowledge, but that he would know from experience the hurts, the pain, the suffering, what we endured as we went through this life. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Let's go on <clears throat> into verse number 19. Kind of pull this down a little bit. We're going to talk about sockets. 
Verse number 19. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards. Sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. The scripture tells us concerning these sockets that they were to be made of silver. And silver is very interesting as you study in the, the scripture. Let's turn over a few pages if you're in Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. Now, if I could just throw this in here, there's, here to make it a little bit clear to you. What we're reading here in Exodus chapter 26 is God speaking to Moses. All right? Now, if you go back a little bit farther in Exodus, you find Moses talking to the people. And he's saying basically the same things. Maybe the wording is just a little bit different. But he's saying basically the same things. And then you see, you see action that is taking place on the part of the children of Israel. But in Exodus chapter 30... And verse number 16, there was an offering that was going to be taken. And in verse number 16, it's described, And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and, that, and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. This atonement money was... Uh, an offering that was required. God instructed Moses to receive of all of the male, all the males of the, the nation of Israel that they would come and that they would give one silver coin. I think it was a shekel, if I'm not mistaken. They had to give one shekel of silver. And, and they had to give that to the tabernacle. Now that silver... And there was more than just sockets, but there were different things in the tabernacle that would have been made of silver. That silver was melted down and used to construct everything in the tabernacle that was made of silver. And that silver that was given was called an atonement, the atonement money. That's what he's talking about in Exodus chapter 30 and verse number 16. He's talking about the atonement money. And that's, and, and so silver has kind of, I guess, from that, it's picked up on that, and silver is, is often typical of the atonement or of the sacrifice, of the atonement that was paid for our sins, atonement that was made for our sins. He says, Thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And so they used that atonement money of silver and they, uh, they began to make all of the different things. And you can see silver in different parts of this, of this uh, uh, I'll call it a post. You can see silver in different parts of it. And so the silver, the material even that it, uh, that it is made of, it speaks to us. And it talks to us about the preciousness, and I assume that's a word, but it talks to us about the preciousness of our salvation. The, the atonement that has come to us is very valuable. You say, carry that over in the New Testament and, 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 and tell us what you're talking about. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 18, Peter says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Listen, silver did not atone for anybody. Silver does not make anyone righteous. Silver does not give us a right relationship with God. It was simply a symbol. And, and, and it's so interesting. And, and, and uh, we don't want to get real bogged down in it because we might be able to come back to it a little bit later. But, but uh, everybody, rich or poor, they gave the same amount. One shekel. Of silver. The atonement is the same for everyone. 
We all need atonement. Whether we're rich, whether we're poor, whether we're a slave, whether we're free, it doesn't matter, the case, whatever the case might be, we need the same atonement. We all need the work of Jesus Christ. We all need the, uh, the work that was accomplished upon the cross of Calvary for the atonement of our sins. It's the same price. Amen. Jesus does not have to suffer anymore because you were, you were extra bad. He didn't have to suffer any less because someone was extra good, so to speak. But yet he suffered, and his suffering was enough for everybody. His suffering, the same sacrifice, the same offering that Jesus Christ gave upon the cross of Calvary was the same for everybody. That atonement that he made was good for me. It was good for you. It doesn't matter what kind of background, what kind of situation you come from. It was good for us. Amen. It worked. Thank God. I'm glad for the salvation, the atonement that Jesus Christ brought to us. That socket was what was the foundation of all of the tabernacle. That, that socket was the foundation. Everything in the tabernacle rested all of this wall, all of this structure, it rested upon that socket. And so it is with the plan of salvation. Everything rests upon that, on the salvation. Everything rests upon that atonement. Everything rests upon the work of Christ. There's nothing, there's nothing of the, the works that we accomplish. There's nothing good that you can do to gain access into the presence of God. There's nothing, you, you, can't, you can't pay enough. You can't, uh, you can't sing enough. You can't do enough good deeds. You've got to have the work of Jesus Christ that was finished upon the cross of Calvary. That's the foundation. Paul said, no other foundation can any man lay that has already been laid. He's talking about the work of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. There's nothing else that we can do. There's nothing else that we can add to it. There's nothing else that will bring righteousness into our life except for the redemption that Jesus Christ has brought to us. I want to look at a couple passages of Scripture. Let's turn to, to uh, Psalms. I'm sorry, Psalms 49. <coughs> Psalm 49 and verse, verses 6 through 8. Again, we have here the psalmist, whether it be David or who else, but the psalmist here is looking from a time of the law and somehow God gives him a glimpse into the, the plan of grace that is to come. Psalm 49, verse number 6, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Look at verse number 8, For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. Amen. He was looking to a time whenever uh, riches wouldn't... He, he was saying these things cannot bring atonement. But there's going to have to be grace. There's going to have to be grace that is given to him. Now, if you go back one more chapter to Psalm 50, and it's just one passage of Scripture, but think about what it says. Verse number 9. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. No more. No more. Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice. Thank God. Jesus Christ, the redemption that he brought, the salvation that he brought into our lives, he is the final sacrifice. There is no other blood that has to be shed. There is no one else that has to die for the remission of sins. 
The blood of Jesus Christ covers it all. Amen. The blood of Christ covers it all. Well, I've got one more to cover in ten minutes. I'm going to try to finish it in ten minutes if I can. Let's look in Exodus again. Chapter 26 and go down to verse number 26 and let's read through verse 30. And let's switch to a different picture here. We're going to talk about the dollars. And that's the really have a good, real good picture of the bars, but this will do. Verses 26 through 30. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold for places for the bars. And listen to this. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. Now, let me ask you, what were the materials that these bars were made of? What's that? Wood and gold. What kind of wood? Acacia, acacia wood. Now, what do you think that's a symbol of? What do you think that typifies? Sound like anything else that we talked about? It typifies Christ, doesn't it? It typifies Christ, the flesh covered with the gold. So what we have here again is another picture of Christ in another aspect of his ministry in the church. You see here in the bars. See the bars that go all the way around? Then you have these little, I think those are called the tenons. They support, they add the support to the walls that holds everything up steady. But these, now to, to me, in this picture, they look silver. But I think it's just because of the lighting. It's because over here they come with more of a goldish color. But anyway, the scripture says, that they were of acacia wood that was covered with gold, which again is a picture of Christ. But what we want, what we have to realize is that these bars were put through the sockets. They were put through this, these boards, and then they were held up, and to the bars were attached the linen wall. And so all of the wall, all of the exterior structure of the of the tabernacle was held up by the bars, wasn't it? So we could say we could say that the church was held up, the tabernacle was held up by these bars. Everything was pulled together by the bars. You have the boards attached. Right? By the bars, you have the boards attached to the, to the uh, linen. You have everything brought together. You have everything tied together. And one of the scriptures that um, uh, kind of brings this out, and I don't think we read it in the verses of scripture. Yeah, it's in verse number 24 of Exodus 26. They shall be, now listen to this, coupled together. They are coupled together beneath. They shall be coupled together above the head of it. Thus shall it be for them. They shall be for the two corners. It is, if I could use the terminology that is used there, these bars are used to couple together, to bring together everything that, that makes up the exterior of the tabernacle. It's what upholds the tabernacle. Jesus Christ is the one that upholds the church. Jesus Christ is the one that brings everything together. The scripture says, in him we live. 
In Him we move. In Him we have our being. So it is in Jesus Christ. I remember Brother Gallagher, always, he used to always say this when he was preaching. There are no big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. Amen. We are all held together by Jesus Christ. We are all brought together in the presence. It is Jesus Christ. Isn't there a scripture, and I think it's in Isaiah chapter 9, maybe right around verse number 6, that the scripture says that the government shall be upon his shoulders? He's holding it up, isn't he? He's holding it up. Whether it be the government of a church, whether it be the government of a kingdom, Jesus Christ is the one that holds it up. Now, I want to look at another passage of Scripture that talks about this, and it's in the book of Isaiah. So if you would, turn there. And I, I, I think this passage brings this out so beautifully. In Isaiah chapter 22, <clears throat> verses 20 through 25. Listen to this. And it shall come to pass in that day that while I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open. See this door? He shall open. And none shall shut. And he shall shut. And none shall open. Listen to this. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. There's a glorious throne. Thank you. He shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall, listen to this. They shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house and the offspring and the issue all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups even the vessels all, to all the vessels of flagons in that day saith the Lord of hosts shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall and the, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord hath spoken it he's talking about the one that would come and that he would uphold it he was like a nail that was fastened in a sure place. Now, we see Jesus Christ, quote unquote, cut down, don't we? But when he comes up out of the grave, he comes out with more power. He comes out with more authority. He comes out victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He has defeated every foe. And he stands there as the head of the church. All authority, all power, all dominion has been given into the hands of Jesus Christ. And now he rules. Now he reigns. He is the head of the church. Thank God. And when we are brought into the kingdom of God, when you, have been, when you were brought into the kingdom of God, you were brought into Christ Jesus. You were baptized into Jesus Christ. And now you make up this, this great uh, wall. You make up this great tabernacle. You make up this, this great temple that is the house of God, the kingdom of God, the presence of God, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. And we're all held together by Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one. Our life is in Him. Amen. Our hope is in Him. All that we have is found in Him. Held together by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all, isn't He? Amen. And in Him, the church is united together and brought together. Thank God for the unity that the church of Jesus Christ there is no, let me tell you something. There may be churches that argue, but there are no arguments in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because what the head says goes. 
There may be splits. There may be schisms. There may be divisions in a church. But there is no schism. There is no division. There is no uh, difference of opinion in the body of Christ, in the church of Christ. Because what the head says goes. He holds us all together. You say, what about the church? Is there much future for the church? You better believe there's a future for the church. Amen. The gates of hell can come against it. The gates of hell can, can barge against the kingdom of God. Picture that tabernacle, not just uh, as some tent that was put up out in the wilderness, but picture is the kingdom of God. And picture Jesus Christ as bars and tenons and, and boards that are, that are holding everything up. And picture uh, Jesus Christ, the door. And picture the gates of hell barging against the door. Who is going to overcome Christ? He's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's already victorious. And so all I have to do is just stand there in Jesus Christ. All I have to do is just dwell there in Jesus Christ. And when the dust settles in this wilderness, I'll be standing in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he said, the gates of hell shall not be If you want to be standing when the dust settles at the end of time, stand in Christ. Amen. Stand in Jesus Christ, coupled together. Amen. That reminds me of the scripture, scriptures that talk about if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, if I could, I'd like to read uh, the first five verses of this passage of Scripture. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes this morning about the mercy of God. 